Good evening and welcome to RFL. I am Richard French. Thanks for joining us tonight. We're going to begin with the overseas developments in Paris where authorities have killed suspects allegedly involved in the der deadly terror attacks. We're going to now join Marcy Gonzalez. She joins us live from New York City with the latest. Good evening. Al Qaeda in Yemen has now claimed responsibility for Wednesday's attack, while today three accused terrorists took the lives of several more victims before police closed in. Two tense standoffs leaving three accused terrorists in France dead. We're hopeful that the immediate threat is now resolved. First at this printing company nearly 30 miles outside of Paris, police cornered the two brothers they say carried out Wednesday's massacre at the satirical newspaper Charlie Hebdo. The interior minister says Sharif and Syed Kouachi exchanged gunfire with officers, then holed up inside, not knowing one of the employees was still there hiding. The brothers then reportedly called a French TV station, saying they were commissioned by al-Qaeda in Yemen and were defending the Prophet Muhammad. Meanwhile, inside a kosher supermarket east of Paris, police say another accused terrorist, Ahmedi Kolobali, killed four hostages. He reportedly called the same television station, claiming he synchronized his attack with the Kawachis and that he was a member of ISIS. <laughs> Investigators say Kolobali also murdered a police officer in a shootout yesterday and was killed in today's siege. His accomplice is still on the run. Today, through a translator, French President Francois Hollande said the country remains on high alert. France also knows that it is not over yet with the threats. And there is a big rally scheduled in Paris for Sunday. That is the same day Attorney General Eric Holder will meet with other world leaders there to discuss combating terrorism. Reporting live, Marcy Gonzalez, ABC News. Now back to you. Thank you, Marcy. And as we can see from the terror attacks, not just in Paris, but before in Madrid and Sydney, Australia, and even here in American soil, Western parts of the world hardly immune from vicious attacks that we once only saw in the Middle East. And today I spoke with Michael O'Hanlon, a senior fellow, co-director with the Center for the 21st Century Security and Intelligence, about this and a number of their issues facing the 21st face of terror, and also how the terror attacks have expanded throughout the globe. You know, certainly I don't have to remind this audience, uh, given September 11th, uh, that terrorism uh, isn't bound to just the Middle East. But in recent years, we got used to the headlines, whether it was Afghanistan, Iraq, or even Pakistan or in the surrounding area. But in the last year, we've seen out of Sydney, Australia, out of Ottawa and Canada, and now in Paris, should this go from what was a potential worry from security analysts that this would go beyond the borders of the Middle East and, and back into the Western world to now a growing reality? Well, I think you framed the question and I can give an opinion, but the only thing that's going to prove the answer is what happens in the rest of 2015 and beyond. Because it's true, as you say, we've seen a fairly rapid sequence of attacks, including in some places that had not yet been attacked or had been thought to be largely safe, and maybe Canada would be exhibit A in that regard. Certainly France has been the victim of terrorist action before, and uh, there's a long-standing pattern of close U.S.-French cooperation against uh, terrorism going back to the 1980s. Uh, and so I'm not surprised that France would be a target, but clearly it's tragic what's happened this week in France. You know, we do have to keep in mind, though, I always, I always like to try to encourage people not to go too far in either direction with terrorism, not to poo-poo the threat, but also not to hyperventilate at a moment like this, because we've had many uh, attacks of this size and shape before. Uh, including, for example, the Fort Hood shooting in the United States in 2009. And this is sort of of a scale of the Boston attack. It's a few more fatalities, tragically. But, you know, it's not as if we've ever been innocent or free of these kinds of attacks in the post-9-11 era or even before. And you always have to ask, is there a trend line that's getting worse? But there have been a lot of attempted attacks that have been stopped in recent years as well. And so I think we're actually just trying to understand what's sort of the baseline, what's the norm. And my guess is the norm is more worrisome than some people would like to believe, but it's actually not nearly as catastrophic and not headed in nearly as apocalyptic of a direction as some might worry at this kind of a moment. 
there are some commonalities, whether it's a perversion about what Islam called for or whether it's there's training at the hands of al-Qaeda or al-Qaeda connected, uh, uh, you know, uh, operatives. Um, or just people that are disenfranchised um, from an Arabic background that don't feel that they fit in, uh, especially in countries that have toughening economies and there is a growing anti-immigrant sentiment. Are there any parallels or anything that we can draw from this as you try to figure out how to make this less appealing to people who seem like they've got nothing to lose? Well, and I would even take your point one step further, by the way, and say that there are some similarities between these attacks and what's happened in Newtown and Oklahoma City and Virginia Tech. You know, it's not all about Islamic extremism. Mm -hmm. It's often deranged or angry or, uh, you know, somehow disenfranchised individuals, as you say. And quite often it's associated with this broader Islamist threat, but quite often it's individuals acting on their own, especially in the United States, where the threat of these kind of non-jihadist attacks is still, I think, greater than the threat of what we just saw in Paris. Uh, I don't know how you come up with a systematic strategy. There are a number of things you have to try to keep doing. You try to keep underscoring your acceptance and admiration for Islam as a religion. You try to work on political reform and the peace process in the Middle East. You try not to paint any kind of Islamist as equally threatening and violent. And I think we need to actually be a little more open to groups like the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which is being squelched right now by a government that we're supporting pretty strongly, and that may be some concern. But I don't think, the, no, I don't think there is a single simple answer. It's a part of the world that has many hundreds of millions of underemployed and frustrated individuals. A lot of their governments and economies are not doing well. Uh, there's a fairly strong prevalence of extremism among a lot of the preaching uh, in a number of the individual uh, Muslim leaders. I think we can certainly encourage our Muslim friends to continue what most of them are already doing, uh, which is to remind their believers that Islam is not a violent religion, that these visions of martyrdom and 72 virgins in heaven if only you kill uh, infidels on earth, th these are ridiculous abominations and perversions of Islam, and the religion is much greater than these kinds of twists uh, and distortions of what it's all about. You keep you keep talking about that, you keep trying to find other people who can talk about it more effectively than we can, but I don't think there is a simple answer. As long as a group like ISIS is seen as being on the upswing, having positive momentum, having success on the battlefield, controlling space, uh, providing sanctuary to groups like the Khorasan group that may have had some linkage uh, with these attacks in, in Paris this week, uh, that is a very, very unfavorable thing because it makes jihadism look sexy, makes it look appealing and uh, gives it momentum, and we've got to have a serious strategy uh, for Iraq and Syria. I think we have an okay strategy for Iraq. We have a, a very poor strategy for Syria. We're going to have to do more there rather than less uh, to change the dynamics on that battlefield. Michael, I even hesitate when I go to this question because I know there's so many holes in it and potential dangers if we even went down this road, but these two guys were identified, uh, not just by the French authorities, but by us as well. I mean, they were a terror watch list. They'd even gone through uh, the criminal system in France. Uh, we, they were on the uh, no-fly list as related to the states. It seems that so many of these folks, when we go back, that there were warning signs. Post-World War II in Germany, um, it was illegal um, to do anything that was perceived to be anti-Semitic. Um, can you draw brighter lines as that you cannot in effect, uh, you know, work with, um, um, do any collaboration with Al-Qaeda or any of its related operatives? Do we need to draw a brighter line, especially when we look back with granted Monday morning quarterbacking and saying, we knew these were bad guys, we only seem to be waiting until they did something? Well, it's a good question, but of course, one of the dead brothers did spend time in jail, and I guess he could have been put back there for reading jihadist websites. But um, it's fairly hard to, in a Western society, to arrest people for reading, uh, no matter what they're reading. And in some ways, of course, this is the flip side of the fact that most of us, even if we don't admire all aspects of what the French publication was typically doing with its cartoons and its satire, we would still say they had the right to do that. Yep. And we can't shut that down. And, I, and I'm not sure we can shut down people reading jihadist websites. But you, you're asking a valid question. And uh, I think certainly if this threat gets worse, I think you would have to revisit some of the very questions you're very 
correctly raising. And you could consider making some of this sort of stuff illegal even to read, even to talk about. Um, it's hard to do that in a Western society. It's sort of against most of our beliefs, but if the threat gets bad enough, you may have to contemplate that. I'm not recommending it now, but uh, I'll try to keep an open mind because your question is spot on. Well, a little bit later in the program, uh, we'll be talking with a panel on the journalistic side of this, about the cartoons and about where the line starts and stops there, but also about the decisions American press uh, had to make in the afternoon, whether or not to show those cartoons, and they'll win on that. But when we come back, we'll come much closer to home first. There doesn't appear to any end in sight here between the feud, between the mayor's office and police plaza. Does the mayor actually owe the NYPD an apology? Is it time that the mayor crack down on the NYPD, as well as the commissioner, to say, you don't get to decide how many arrests you feel like making here. You don't get to make slow down decisions on your own. We're going to get into all that as a panel. Always in on that and so much more.